Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to our annual post-budget analysis in Buzzwells. Uh, we really appreciate everyone coming on such a, a wet morning. I know it took me a considerable time to get in here today. And I also want to welcome everyone who is tuning in to our webinar online on our YouTube channel. And uh, anybody tuning in online, if you have any questions for us in the Q&A session, just email them to conference at socialjustice.ie and we will answer them. So my name is Michelle Murphy. I'm the research and policy analyst of Social Justice Ireland. On my left here is Eamon Murphy, my colleague, the economic and social analyst, and Sean Healy, our director. So this morning, we are going to give a presentation going through the very various aspects of our budget response. Everybody should have a copy. You should have gotten it at the registration desk when you came in. If you don't, you can pop out and get one. So we're going to look at the overall budget context, the allocations may announced yesterday in budget 2018, looking at issues as, such as taxation, investment, the impacts on various groups and income deciles, and then we're going to give our overall assessment of budget 2018, and we'll follow this by a question and answer session. So to start off, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Eamon, who will lead off our presentation this morning. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, so this is obviously the uh, second budget of this particular government and the first under a new Taoiseach. Um, yesterday, Minister Donoghue said in his speech that the budget offers an opportunity to recognise what's been achieved and what we want to achieve, so setting the direction that we want to see Ireland moving in. And he also said that on this budget day we build on progress that would have looked impossible only a few short years ago. It's important to acknowledge that um, the economy is, is running quite well at the moment. The, uh, employment numbers will attest to that, but Social Justice Ireland has always been of the opinion that economic growth for its own sake should, has never been the goal. Economic growth is how you generate the resources to build a society that you want. And it was heartening to hear Minister Donoghue speaking at the Dublin Economics Workshop a few weeks ago, where he said that a recovering economy is not the same as a recovered society. And uh, Irish people have had to deal with an awful lot over the last decade. So this budget was put forward in the context of uh, some of the indicators that you see on page 20 in the document that you have in front of you. Um, Ireland is by any measure a rich country. It's a low tax economy and yet we have uh, severe infrastructure deficits and services are not quite at the same level as they've not, not even not quite. They're a long way from what they are in equivalent European countries. Some of the, uh, the figures there that are on page 20 to set the context of the budget. Um, we have an ageing population. We have a lot of positives in the labour market, but a lot of negatives as well. Um, for example, the way the national minimum wage falls so, so far below the living wage. But um, the numbers that are going to st uh, stand out most there are under the housing section. Uh, completely unacceptable numbers of people on local authority waiting lists. Completely unacceptable numbers of homeless people in society. But the number that I'd like to draw your attention to is the second last in the left column, it's under taxation. Uh, Ireland's total revenue as a percentage of GDP, as noted in budget, budget documentation yesterday, will be 26.1%. That's almost 9% below the, uh, the mark that Eurostat sets for a low tax economy, never mind the fact that we're so far behind what's the European average and particularly so for the countries that we would wish to emulate, those of Western Europe. So that's the context in which the budget was put out. And uh, with that in mind, we called for uh, investment over tax cuts. Any, any money that was available, we said, should be invested in public services rather than given back in, uh, in cuts. Um, we, we, we called for uh, an increase in overall revenue as a proportion of national income. And it was good to see that the government um, is moving not, not very much, but slightly away from this argument that the budget is the fiscal space and that um, anything above that, you know, you, you can f kind of forget about it. The budget is more than the fiscal space. Social Justice Ireland put forward uh, four, uh, four billion worth of options for raising additional revenue in our budget choices document back in July. Um, unfortunately, the government chose to ignore most of them, but it was good to see them uh, looking at the area of stamp duty as a way of uh, raising additional revenue. But Generally speaking, they've ignored the, uh, the possibilities that were there. On page 19, I beg pardon, page 17, we've, uh, we've laid out the government finances, the projected government finances over the, over the next three years. 
Um, that's, that table is particularly hard on the eye, but uh, the, one of the key numbers, I think, is the, the $5.3 billion in gross voted capital expenditure in 2018. That's up 17% on last year. Now, that's a big uh, jump, but you have to acknowledge the low base that it's coming from. Uh, yesterday, Minister Donoghue noted that investment from 2015 to 2021 was going to increase from 3.7 billion to 7.8. So that's a, that's a doubling of public investment. And uh, yesterday, Minister Donoghue mentioned that that will put us amongst the highest in the European Union for investment. Um, let's let's just call that what it is. That's a complete distortion of the argument. Uh, investment levels in Ireland might be high as a proportion of overall expenditure. But our expenditure, as, as noted in, in page 20, is well below the European average. And our investment levels, having been very low for several years, the lowest in the European Union at one point, they, uh, they are improving, but they're nowhere near where they need to be. So that's the context in which yesterday's budget was put out. Some of the, uh, the areas of expenditure uh, do acknowledge the problems, but just not on the scale that needs to be. And uh, my colleagues Sean and Michelle will, uh, will analyse those on a case-by-case -case basis now. So we look first of all at the issue of taxation. Um, now some of you are very familiar with the changes that have been int introduced already. Just to clip through some of them, I'm not going to go through all the detail. Um, the USC, um, there's no change for people with incomes below 12,102 or sort of 112 euro. This, by the way, is on pages 10 and 11 of the document you have there. Uh, so we take it through there, we spell out the various changes that are there. Uh, up, to thir um, up to 13,000 is now exempt from USC. Um, then if you are, if you do have a, a larger income, you pay 0 0.5 on the first 12,000, 2% 2 up to 19 plus thousand, and then four and three quarter percent up to 70,000. And after that, it's 8%, it's unchanged. Uh, a number of other changes on that. Uh, the total amount um, that was uh, put into tax, uh, the, the USC cut, was 177 million. On the income tax side, uh, there was um, the expansion, uh, there was the threshold at which people come in uh, to the 40% rate was raised by 750 for a single person. Um, and then, for, and also 750 for a couple with one earner, uh, but by 1500 for a couple with two earners. Uh, there was also an increase in the home care tax credit, the earned income tax credit, um, mortgage interest relief available to owner occupiers uh, was extended to 2020, a 0% benefit in kind rate. There was a number of different other things of that nature. The cost of the income tax package uh, was 107 million euro. Excise duties increased um, on cigarettes and so on. And then the, the, the tax on sugar sweetened drinks will be introduced from April uh, 2018 with a yield in 2018 of 30 million. The excise duties, by the way, will bring in an, ex an extra 64 million. Um, stamp duty then, the rate of stamp duty on a non residential property was trebled to 6%. And then they claim that the total yield for that will be 376 million. Uh, corporation tax, the deduction for capital allowances, which can be used to offset against income arising from relevant intangible assets, was reduced from 100% to 80%, bringing in an extra 150 million. Now there's a number of other things. The, the uh, national training and F fund and levy was in, increased. Uh, the revenue compliance, there's some issues there. 100 million reckoned to come in from that. And then the vacant site levy, will remain at 3% for the first year, increasing to 7% uh, in the second year. And if there's still no action, that basically puts together, it would mean over two years, you pay 10% on that. Now, in our uh, kind of a, a response to it, which is on page 11 of our response there, uh, we're pointing out that in the budget choices document that we published in July, uh, late June, early July, which set out a fully costed alternative budget for government, we made six proposals. Um, and we spell them out there. The first three weren't implemented at all, but the other three were. So in that sense, from our perspective, uh, there has been some progress on the tax issues. The issue, though, is that the, the ones that weren't done were the really big ones. So, for example, they didn't make tax credits refundable. 
which would have meant that the low pay issue could have been dealt with, or uh, people, particularly the working poor issue, could have been given priority. They also uh, broadened the band uh, on um, the, the, uh, for the at which people are raised the threshold. People that will, uh, go into the forty percent rate. We would have fairer options, which I'll come back to in a second. And uh, they didn't reform the research and development tax credit. Uh, nor did they introduce a 6% minimum effective ta corporate tax rate for corporations, which we believe is absolutely essential. So on the other side, we welcome the changes on the vacant site levy and on the stamp duty and on the uh, national training fund levy because we in fact uh, looked for those. However, I think it's important uh, to point out that fairer options were possible. So this might be kind of where you, we start to show you stuff that you haven't heard about before at uh, this moment. On page four, what we have done is we have taken the amount of money that government spent uh, on the USC change and on the um, change in uh, the, the, uh, the tax band, and we have looked at the impact of that. Now, if you go to page six for a moment, there's a chart at the top of the page which shows the impact at the top of page six. And you see there, forget the left-hand bar, we'll come back to that later when I talk about welfare, but you see that basically you get very little at the bottom end and then as the, your income rises, you do very well. Uh, in fact, if, you're, uh, if, you had a, if you compare a single person on 25 grand, with a single person on 75 grand, the person on 75 grand gains five times more in this budget than the person on 25. So you can see that the benefits are skewed up the line, and the more money you have, the better you actually do, and the more you get back. We believe that that's unfair, particularly in a situation where there's uh, an awful lot of uh, people in poverty, where there's a quite substantial incidence of low pay, where Ireland's low pay uh, numbers are very, are in, the incidents are very high by European standards. So on page four, what we've done is we have put together two of our own proposals, which would have cost exactly the same amount of money as the government, in fact, slightly less money than the government's proposals. So we would have done two things with, this, with the money that, would, that the government used. We'd have made tax credits refundable, which would mean that people on uh, the working poor would have benefited from the ba balance of the tax credits they don't benefit from at the moment because they're, er they're not earning enough to pay enough tax to benefit. So that would, the technical thing is making tax credits refundable. That's what it's called. The second thing, we'd have enough money left over to give everybody with a job 100 euro in addition of a, a year. So the impact would have been as shown on the chart on page four. So what you see is that it is completely level for single people and for uh, couples with two earners. So you have uh, a, a, a very steady sort of gro uh, growth, if you like, or a, a distribution, and it's very fair. And we would, have argue, we would argue very strongly that would have been a far fairer thing for government to do, and they sh we were kind of disappointed that they didn't take this option. The skewed outcome of the income tax measures in budget 2018 could have been avoided. A fair, a fairer alternative was available, but it actually wasn't taken. So I think that's that's kind of important to know. The second issue in this is that the, the corporate tax, the approach to corporation tax, uh, we would argue, is broken. Um, we've been arguing this for years without a huge amount of support. But now we find ourselves being supported by a whole range of institutions uh, across the world. And we, we have a note there on page four where the headline says corporate tax approach is broken. Um, it made, we think that it made some limit, the budget made some limited progress in addressing the, the, the significant limitations and inequities within the corporate tax system. But there's been great growing pressure on Ireland to face up to the fact that its corporate tax approach isn't actually uh, what it ought to be. And we have seen, for example, reports from the Department of Finance saying uh, every, all the corporations paid 12, or 11 12 percent. Last week, we saw another report, the week before last, we saw another report that said 13 of the 
richest 100 companies pay tax of less than 1%. This is the claim that we have been making for quite a long time. Now it's being borne out by the, the, the research of others. Uh, we believe that government should introduce a minimum effective corporate tax of 6%. It still allows government from 12.5% down to 6 the, the space to reduce the, the actual amount if, for example, the, you wanted the corporation to uh, locate in a rural area or put money into research and development in a real way or that, that kind of stuff. But it, it, at, the, at the bottom line, we feel that if a, co a corporation goes away with 94% of its profits intact when we're taking six, that's not a, an unfair deal, <laughs> particularly when you think of the corporate of the tax rates that ordinary people pay in the PAYE sector. So I think that would be the, the, the kind of second item that we would want to highlight in response. And finally, on page seven, we have the bottom story there uh, on the bottom of that page is one that I think uh, needs to be highlighted. And that is that the low overall tax take is not sustainable in the long run. Okay? Sort of, um, we're, it, the, the, the tax for the next five years, the tax take is spelt out in the budget documentation. But over, uh, we believe that, uh, in fact, Ireland has, this isn't just us, when you look at the international statistics, Ireland's uh, a total tax take is only about two-thirds of the European average. So there's quite a substantial space between what Ireland takes and what the European average uh, would be. We're not even asking that Ireland go to the European average, but we're saying that uh, it should move in that direction. And we believe that it's essential to do that if we're going to deal with the fact that we have serious infrastructure problems, serious service delivery problems, and that we have an expanding population and that our population is aging. All of these mean extra bills and we can't pretend that we're going to generate good infrastructure and good social services um, with uh, two-thirds of the European average in our tax take. The issue for us is to make sure that the tax take goes up, but that it's done in a fair and just way, and that the various sectors, including the corporate sector, make a fair contribution towards it. So I hand you back to Michelle. Thanks, Sean. So I, I'm just going to take you now to the main areas, um, I suppose the main spending areas. But first, if you, at 12 and 13, just outline the, the main revenue and expenditure that, that government is going to be um, focused on next year. And I suppose the one thing to point out is how reliant we are on income tax, PRSI and VAT, uh, you know, to fund uh, our services. So despite uh, the changes made in the budget, we're still not moving to broad towards broadening the tax base significantly in order to fund services into the future because our population is growing so it's also aging which means in the future there'll be less people in employment so you can't rely solely on income tax and PRSI to be funding our services so I think this is an area that certainly in budget 2018 uh, an opportunity was there to begin addressing this but um, government didn't take up that opportunity so first off, I'm going to look at housing, which is on page five. So there were a number of announcements in relation to housing yesterday. Um, but as Eamon mentioned earlier, we have a record number of people who are homeless in the country. We have over 90,000 households who are on the waiting list for social housing. So we're in the midst of a crisis that seems to be continually spiraling out of control. Um, the Minister announced that we'll have 3,800 new social housing units to be built in 2018, but you have 90,000 households on the waiting list. It's not even a drop in the ocean when it comes to addressing that. And we are still relying on the private sector to address a public need because the initiatives that were announced yesterday, include, including the Home Building Finance Ireland, it's still a commercial entity to look at commercial investment in housing finance. It doesn't deal with the social housing issue. Uh, we have the lowest number of properties available to rent uh, in over a decade. So even the increase in HAP, which is welcome, is just going to be eaten up by those rent increases. And HAP doesn't actually deliver any housing units whatsoever. It's simply a payment to support people who are in rental accommodation. And those who are on the housing assistance payment, the majority of those 
because rents are so high at the moment, the HAP payment doesn't come close to the actual rent that they're paying, so they're still having to top up, make up the difference themselves. We welcome the allocation of, for homeless services of 17 million, but that's simply just dealing with the increasing demand. We have to look at how you prevent homelessness. In order to do that, to do that we need to increase housing supply. We have made a number of proposals, and we're not the only group to have done this over a number of years in terms of how you increase housing supply, in particularly focusing on social housing. So you separate this issue from the private rented market and the private commercial build and private house building in order to take those households on social housing out of that market, which would both bring down rents, but then government would also have an asset by building social housing units. Uh, there was additional capital funding, which is welcome, of 326 million to be supplemented by 77 million with local authority self-financing. But I mean, as we've said numerous times, the scale of the challenge is immense, and this amount of money is, you know, simply a drop in the ocean. And I think uh, this government will certainly be judged on whether or not they got to grips with the housing crisis and addressed the scale. It will take time to resolve, but it needs leadership and it needs radical change and ambition and the home building finance ireland um agency that was announced yesterday with the investment of 750 million from the ireland strategic investment fund i mean that 750 million could have been used um in a much better way to look at how you set up a similar vehicle but a vehicle solely addressed on social housing and providing social housing units uh, we've made this proposal a number of times, it's detailed at the bottom of page five, uh, looking at how the, such an agency would fund local authorities and approved housing bodies to fund social housing and using the collateral, collateral of social housing units that we already have to go and borrow money, which we can do at record low interest rates at the moment. We do welcome the vacant site levy, I mean we've been looking for that for a number of years and the fact that it will rise to 7% in second and subsequent years. I suppose the challenge is it doesn't come into effect until 2019. The 7% won't come into effect then until 2020. So in order for it to have an effect on people hoarding undeveloped land, that will take time. So it doesn't do enough to address um, the loophole that was introduced uh, in previous budgets, which allows people to sit on undeveloped land and and that is a real challenge that we have and the budget didn't do enough to address this and neither did it look at the issue of um, vacant housing stock and how you promote that and bring that back into use. On page 11 then is education, the bottom of page 11. So the education budget um, allocated some welcome money to provide for demographic growth and that includes the 1,200 additional teaching posts and also an additional 1,000 plus special needs assistance. Um, it allocated an initial 28 million in capital expenditure for budget for 2018, uh, 8 million of which is earmarked for further and higher ed education, a lot of that for the apprenticeship program. It increased the employer contribution to the National Training Fund, as Sean said, and a lot of that money will be part of the additional 64.5 million for further and higher education. And it, there was an additional four million to broaden access to third level, and additional seven and a half million for new, various new policy measures. And we do welcome the allocation providing for demographic growth. But I suppose the challenge is to make up for the cuts that were implemented in previous years. We do welcome the commitment to be to reduce the primary staffing schedule to twenty six to one. However, we have the second highest average class size in the EU and the eighth highest pupil teacher radio ratio at primary level. So future budgets need to be focused on reducing this further. Um, the additional allocation to higher education is welcome, but I suppose what's very disappointing is the Cassell's report has been published. There was a special Oireachtas committee set up to discuss it. The Oireachtas committee met, met with uh, various groups. It produced a report. Yet the government, or in Budget 2018, didn't produce any strategy for how they're going to fund higher education into the future, or how they might resource it, and that's disappointing. Uh, we asked for a provision in the budget to support part-time students in higher education at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Unfortunately, there was nothing there to support them. There was investment in skill nets in terms of training, 
particularly for training those who are in employment, that's very welcome. But we regret that there wasn't an allocation for community education and for vocational education for people who are not in the labour market because that's equally important. Now, in terms of social protection, which is on page 14, the um, increase in primary weekly social welfare rates by five euro is very welcome, as are the proportional increases for qualified adults. Um, and job seekers allowance for under 26s was increased by the full five euros as well. There was an increase in the qualified child increase uh, in the state pension as well. Um, there was a telephone support allowance introduced for those who were in receipt of the living alone allowance. There was a one week increase in the fuel allowance. The earnings threshold for the working family payment was increased. The earnings disregard for the one parent family payment was partially restored. And it was also increased for those on the job seekers transition payment. The Christmas bonus was maintained at 85%. Unfortunately, there was no increase in direct provision allowance rates, uh, job seekers rates, benefit rates for under 26s were not equalised, which is something we had asked for in the budget. So that is disappointing. Uh, and it means young people are yet again being discriminated against. Um, it doesn't, the budget in terms of social welfare, it doesn't really do uh, a huge amount, amount in terms of reaching our targets in terms of child poverty. And also in terms of those older people who are particularly at risk of poverty and experiencing deprivation are those older people living alone. So we're disappointed that uh, the government didn't increase the living alone allowance as we requested or increase the fuel allowance by the 60 or 50 a week we requested. As a, there, the, if you look at the breakdown of the fuel allowance, the increase is 85 cents a week. So it's, it's not a, a huge amount of money for those older people living alone. On Page 18 and 19 are just the actual social welfare rates and the changes um, between budget 2017 and budget 2018, so the increases, so you can see it there. Then on page 15, um, we're looking at what supports they introduced in terms of training, employment, unemployment. So the minimum wage, obviously, is going to increase by 30 cent an hour in January. There was an increase in current and capital allocation for the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation. A Brexit loan scheme to assist SMEs was announced. There was extra funding for Enterprise Ireland to roll out regional funds in particular. There was increased expenditure on training and upskilling people in employment. Job seekers payments were increased. The training fund levy was increased and it was outlined how it will increase further in 2019 and 2020. Um, and then it was also outlined that, you know, employers will have a significant input into the development of training programmes. The expansion of apprenticeships was very welcome. 6,000 new places and 10 new programmes in new sectors. That's incredibly welcome. There was a further 1,000 springboard places. Jobs Plus was enhanced. A youth employment support scheme was announced. Um, we need to see the detail. So the welcome increase in the national minimum wage i mean we welcome that when it was announced in Jul july and we welcome it again it's still significantly lower than the living wage uh we welcome the increased provision and training for people who are employed we take, feel that this should be focused on people who are in low skilled low paid or precarious employment uh, to ensure that they have the relevant skills in order to um either change position or if their employment at some point in the future is terminated so that they can move into a new role. It's really important that we do that. We note the commitment to increasing employment of the regions, yet there was a really, the, the, the level of investment there was not significant, so that will be a challenge. There was a focus on younger and older long-term unemployed people, which is welcome. We need to monitor those programmes to make sure they're working. and. In terms of Brexit, um, it does pose a major major challenge, particularly in relation to employment, uh, particularly in relation to employment in particular er sectors and particular parts of the country. However, I suppose the response by the government, um, there, there is the loan scheme, but other than that, you know, there's not a huge amount in this budget, especially in terms of providing those communities with the infrastructure they need 
for, to support small and medium enterprises, to support micro enterprises, so things like broadband, public transport, the basics, uh, access to services, you know, a uh, Brexit loan scheme is not going to address any of those, so in that sense it's disappointing. Then on page 16 we have healthcare. So healthcare, the health budget every year, um, I suppose, can be, there is the announcement of the actual allocation, but then when you go looking for the money, it can be difficult to find it. So um, the allocation for this budget 2018 was 15.3 billion, an addition of 548 million. So there's a carry over there, there's money for the central pay agreement. So. We have additional resources of two, almost 270 million to fund both existing services and new measures. Um, so we have some details. So there was 35 million for the waiting list initiative. 50 million was committed to acute services. We have 40 million committed to primary care services. 32 million to support older people. A commitment of 35 million for mental health services and 15 million to support young people with a disability, there was a reduction in prescription charges for medical card holders aged between 65 and 70 and a reduction in the monthly payment for the drug threshold um, scheme. However, it's unclear that there is sufficient funding allocated in the budget both to deliver on the commitments and the new initiatives and to meet the demographic pressures that the health service is inevitably going to encounter as our population ages. So in terms of capital investment in community nursing facilities, it's unclear to us if this has been addressed and to what we would argue is required. Um, there is a commitment to move to a community-based model of service provision, but where the, mo where the resourcing for that commitment is is unclear. Um, so if you don't resource it, then you're not going to reach your objective. Um, and if you look at the 2017 health service plan and the full year cost of those commitments compared to what was announced for the budget, then it looks like there is actually very limited amount of additional money available in 2018. And how much of that is going to be eaten up by simply maintaining an existing level of service. And so what, they, what hasn't been put in place really was how we adapt our health services to what the growing needs of our population is going to be and particularly in the area of care so that's home care packages home help how you support older people to stay in their homes for longer how you develop your community and primary care facilities to deal with this how you look at de delivering services to older people who don't live in urban areas who live in more remote rural locations so provisions were not made for that so that's disappointing then finally, in terms of overseas development assistance, which is on the very back page 24. So there was an increase of 55 million, which is welcome in terms of monetary value. However, as a percentage of GNI star, it's just a 0.1% increase. So in terms of our meeting our international commitments, we're making incredibly slow progress. Um, as our economic situation improves it's time you know this provides us with an opportunity to recover lost ground in relation to those commitments particularly if you think uh, that the lead that Ireland took in terms of negotiating the sustainable development goals and the lead we take on various issues in the UN and previously we led on reaching our the UN target of 15% of ODA to least developed countries yet now we're falling back significantly and it will be very challenging for Ireland to even meet the 0.7% target, by, not by 2020, but by 2025. So in that regard, it's disappointing. Now, finally, I'm just going to briefly look at page nine and the impacts on some other groups. So the sugar tax, uh, we have been calling for a sugar tax since 2015. So the, the announcement of this to be introduced in April next year is welcome. What we would like to see is that a proportion of the revenue generated from this should be used to develop effective obesity prevention programs and to meet the targets in government's obesity policy and action plan. Because uh, the whole point of this tax is not only just to generate revenue, but also to promote behavioral change. So the revenue generated should go towards alleviating the problem. We had the report from the World Health Organization this morning about the alarming rise in obesity, particularly among children and teenagers. 
In terms of disability, some steps were taken to improve services and funding. However, in terms of introducing a cost of disability payment, which is something we've asked for for a number of years, that opportunity was missed. We're not making any progress on this issue. Um, people living in disability are more likely to be living in poverty in this country. People with a disability are less likely to be engaged in the labour market or in employment. Um, so despite the 15 million which was allocated to services for young people and the special needs assistance in schools which are welcome, overall the government is not getting to grips with the disability issue and ensuring that those people, if you want people with a disability to be equal participants in society, then you have to mitigate the extra costs that they bear on a day-to-day -day basis. In terms of children, um, the 40 million increase funding for Chisla is welcome, as is the extension of the um, ECCE scheme to 76 weeks, so two, 38 weeks in two years, so it's a, now a two-year programme. However, there has been, and we note the lack of progress in rolling out the affordable childcare scheme, which was announced last year. Uh, the two-year increase in the qualified child announced as part of the social protection budget is welcome, but we have a target to lift a child poverty target that we're due to meet by 2020 to lift at least 70,000 children out of consistent poverty. We've 139,000 children living in consistent poverty in Ireland today. So the measures in the budget are not enough to ensure we meet this target and we didn't introduce any new policy measures and that is disappointing. In terms of older people, as I mentioned before, we welcome the increase in the pension and the limited increase in the fuel allowance, but there's no steps towards planning for how we meet their needs into the future. We're going to have a million people aged over 65 in 2030, yet we're not making any plans for this whatsoever. In terms of rural Ireland, um, the minister yesterday announced an additional allocation of 19 million. Um, that's welcome, so are the 250 places on the Rural Social Scheme. But the government has significant commitments in the Action Plan for Rural Development, which will not be met without a considerable increase in investment. That investment was not there in Budget 2018. It's very disappointing. Where is the ambition and the leadership in relation to its own action plans? I think a lot of people feel incredibly disappointed. A lot of people in the regions and communities and towns across the country this morning feel very disappointed by what was announced in Budget 2018. You know, the small allocations are welcome, the, the town and village renewal scheme, uh, the extra allocation to leader, but it doesn't deal with the challenges that people rural, in rural and regional areas are facing and that, ha that they have been articulating for years. And realistically, unless we do something about broadband, transport and service delivery, we're not going to address these problems into the future. Finally, the environment. Budget 2018 contained little or nothing to ensure that we're going to meet our international commitments in 2020, 2030, or move to, towards our own aim of being carbon neutral in 2050, 2050. We made a significant number of proposals in relation to environmental taxation, none of which were introduced. Budget 2018 means that simply that we're going to continue to pursue policies that will ensure we will exceed our limits in 2020. We will be subject to fines from the European Union and it doesn't, you know, the Taoiseach and the government are on record saying, you know, climate change and the environment are the biggest challenge of our time. And yes, this budget gave a benefit in kind for electric vehicles. You know, that is not how you address one of the biggest challenges of our time. So it's incredibly disappointing in relation to environment. So now I'm going to pass over to Sean and Eamon, who will look at the various other impacts. Okay. Um, the, the, the first thing I want to look at is uh, kind of a, a critical impact in terms of budget. What happens when you put the income tax and social welfare payments together, and who benefits, who doesn't, what's the distribution, and so on? So if you look at page six, it's there in a visual. Um, uh, we have a, a, a bar chart that shows what the story is. Um, you see the uh, unemployed uh, gaining uh, close to, to uh, doing, doing quite well in terms of uh, the, the everybody else. They're keeping pace with quite a number. Um, now, uh, just for clarification purposes, um, there's there's a number that don't gain seem, don't seem to gain very much at all. They're the people on low incomes, but what this does not factor in 
is the actual increase in the minimum wage. And they, some of those will benefit, not all of those, I'll come back to in a moment, some will benefit from it, and that will therefore straighten that out a little bit. Uh, but it's not possible to do that because not everybody benefits from that kind of, of uh, initiative. So we have to look at that separately, which I will in a moment. When you look at couples with one income, people on 25,000 will be 66 euro a year better off. If you have uh, 50,000, that's twice that amount. Your actual gain will not, will, like the first 25,000 will be with one income, they'll be 66 euro a year better off. If you've doubled your that income, you're 278 euro a year better off. And if you've two incomes, the person on 25,000 is 21 euro a year better off. But the person on 50,000 is five and a half times better off. It goes from 21 up to 112 euro a year better off. Not huge money at one level, but at another level, the distribution impact is a bit disturbing because it means that substantially more of the benefit goes to people who have higher incomes. The higher the income, the better they do. Now, an issue that becomes problematic a lot of the time are tax rates. And people talk a lot about the actual uh, marginal tax rate. I mean, the, the minister made a big song and dance about bringing it down to 48.5% and all this kind of thing. We've always argued that that's not the critical issue for people, that the actual critical issue is how much of the total income that you get does the government take away? What's that percentage? In other words, what's the effective tax rate? So for example, if you get, if you get a thousand euro and the government takes 300 away, your effective tax rate is 30%, even if it's mixed up the way they get it because they mix it up with different uh, rates and bands and all that sort of stuff. The thing that matters to you is how much do you get to keep in your pocket or your purse. Now, what we're looking at here on page six is, are the actual numbers on, in table six one, and then a chart to illustrate it uh, below that chart six two. And what you find is, what we've done here is we have looked at people, single people, couples with one earner, couple with two earner, starting from 15,000 and working up to 120,000. And what you find is, uh, and we've looked at it, what was the story at the turn of the millennium in the year 2000? What's the story in 2008? And what's the story in 2018? And what you find is that um, in, in the lower income uh, situation, if you look at it, the, 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 sorry, first of all, from the 2000 thing, everybody pays far less tax as a proportion of the total income they have. All, all effective tax rates have fallen. And if you look at, uh, take, take one randomly, if, if you take uh, people on 25,000, they had 24% tax rate, uh, they were taking 24% of that in tax in 2000, now they pay 12.7 if they're a single. If they're, if they're a couple with one earner, they would have paid 12.3% back in 2000, now they pay 5.9. And uh, if they were a couple with two earners, they'd have paid over 11% back in the day in 2000, but now they pay, they pay only 0.6 of 1%. So all of that has seen a reduction in the effective tax rate that people are actually facing. We would argue that that's a much more sensible thing to look at and that government actually should focus on that rather than all this jumping up and down about the impact on high earners. They, uh, as we see in a second, uh, Ireland has a very high incidence of people with low earnings, and that's an issue that we need to, to address itself, okay? Now, I want to look at a couple of other, uh, the impacts of a, a number of other impacts on page three. Uh, on, first of all, on, uh, on, on the first story there on welfare, obviously, um, we welcome the increase in, in the budget. Uh, in particular, we welcome that it has been distributed across all those dependent on these payments rather than a select few. And the, the budget increase will bring the rate of payment for job seekers, for example, up to 198 euro a week. Not dramatic money, but it's moving in the right direction. Um, the value of payments has actually, of welfare payments, has actually fallen in recent years. We've, we documented that quite clearly in our last publication on budget, budget choices. So that what's being done here is simply trying to get back up to the same value. And it's, it's, it's made a good jump in that direction. 
However, we regret that the budget did not address the need to equalise the rate of job seeker payments for those under 26 um, with the rest of the population. The gap now stands at anything from 43 euro to 88 euro. And we frankly don't accept that that's a valid uh, way of dealing with people under 26 years of age. We regret also that the budget did not increase direct provision payments. There seemed earlier on to be some interest in doing that. And part of the kite flying that went on, a lot of kites flown this year, but uh, in advance of the budget, but uh, and nothing actually happened as a result. Second issue is the minimum wage. Uh, we welcome the increase of 30 cent uh, uh, an hour in the, in the minimum wage. Uh, this is an issue that we've been addressing for quite some time. But we still point out that there's a gap between the minimum wage and the living wage. Uh, now, the living wage is the, what's required to maintain a minimally adequate standard of living, just the basic minimum. Um, and there's a group, uh, a technical group, that calculates the, the living wage every year. The living wage should be, uh, for, for 2017, is 11 euro 70 an hour. So there's quite a gap between that and the minimum, the new minimum wage, which is 9.55. So you're you're talking about two euro 15 cent an hour difference. So people uh, need an extra two or two euro 15 an hour to get them up to just having the basic minimum, no 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 extras whatsoever. Okay, so that's an important point. Again, we we're we're sorry that that, uh, that we're glad of the fact that the minimum wage rose, but I think it needs to move steadily towards the living wage, or we're still going to get um, this problem of low, uh, of, of that a lot of people are going to be left in low pay. That low pay issue uh, we deal with at the bottom of page three. There's something quite dramatic here that people do not refer to or very often. Ireland has a very high rate of low pay among full-time employees. And we have a table there uh, in, on, on page three, which shows that only two countries in the Western world have a higher proportion of their employees on low pay. And they are Colombia and the United States. We are third. 24% of our employees are on low pay. And look at the actual achievements of the lowest countries. Finland has only 7.8. Denmark 8.2, Chile 11.9, Japan 13.5. But we're up there in the bad in the bad uh, area, if you like. So Ireland, uh, what this means in fact is that low-paid people uh, uh, don't all benefit usually from the from the minimum wage increase. So that there's an issue there about, and they won't uh, benefit that much. Some of the very low workers from the USC changes very much either. So. Um, uh, you, you've got to be very careful. Like, for example, a full-time worker on 11.70 an hour, that's a person on 23,800 a year, that's the living wage, receives only one euro 21 per week as a result of this budget. So that's, that's like a group that's slipping between uh, the, the kind of those who are benefiting. And we think that needs to be highlighted because that's a group of people that get ignored generally in the system that we have. Now, I want to move on to page eight because I want to look at what the impact of tax and benefit changes have been on households over the two budgets that this government has brought in. This government has brought in two budgets. So we decided, why don't we take a look at the two budgets to see what's going on here. And we have a chart there, uh, chart eight. Two looks at the overall impact uh, for over the two years on households with jobs, and then chart eight one looks at uh, the impact on welfare dependent households. When you look at the jobs, it's very interesting uh, that the actual major benefits, again, the same trend is maintained, that the higher the income, the more you're likely to have gained. And we have quite a, a number of, of uh, different household types there. Uh, with jobs, single from step, like a single one child at 25,000, all the way up to a couple with two earners on 200,000. And you see the, 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 the impact of the budget, or the two budgets. And very much the resources are going to the bed, up the line, despite claims to the contrary. When you look at the, uh, the welfare ones, um, 
then you get uh, you get a different kind. You get the same kind of thing. Single no job is 10, uh, 1094. The thing I want to point out maybe there is couple couples pensioner couple are actually doing quite well uh, over the two years. They're twenty three euro a week better off, which is almost the same as a couple with two earners on one hundred and fifty thousand between them. So that shows that for whatever reason that particular group is keeping pace, which shows that you can actually have these choices if you, if you decide that you're going to allocate resources in a particular way. I think it's important just to take one other example, if I might, um, from the households with jobs in Chart A2. Um, the gains experience range from €3.71 a week for a single worker on 25 to over seven times that for a couple with two earners on 200 grand. So the person, the, the sort of person with a low paid job, 25,000 uh, and a child, single with a child, uh, is at the at very low level, 3, 7, 3 euro 71. But the person, two earners, 200 grand, they're up at 26 euro plus. So it shows you quite a substantial change in that, in that space. And they were the two impacts. Now I think, uh, handing over, there's still some impact, other impacts, no, not, okay, okay. So, um, fair enough, moving, moving on, as they say. Uh, here we are. Okay. So, when we look at the budget overall then, our basic uh, conclusion is that there is modest progress, but it's lacking in strategy, lacking in ambition. And that, this is important because we're at a moment where, if, when you look at Ireland, there's an awful lot of stuff going on that people are not paying too much attention to. There's all this stuff going on that people are paying huge attention to. There's different types of crises. Some of them are actually getting a lot of attention, like the housing one. Others, maybe like child poverty, aren't getting as much attention as they should or used to, maybe. Uh, we have other crises. Uh, we have the health, the two care, two tier healthcare system. We have problems in education. We have a uh, sort of an urban, rural, regional balance problem of substance. Now, when you look at all of that and you look at the budget, we would say that the budget basically isn't on the scale required to tackle the crises that ordinary Irish people are experiencing in their lives day by day. And it was possible to do better than this. We, would, we have spelt out our own proposals in a fully costed and um, budget and balanced uh, budget set of budget proposals uh, that we published some months ago in our uh, policy briefing on budget choices. And I think uh, what we would now look at is that budget 2018 should be measured by whether it allocates sufficient resources uh, to deal with those crises. And we don't get any feel that that is actually happening. Um, I think we, would have, we have argued that Irish people have accepted extraordinary uh, austerity for almost a decade and that the time has come to deal with the crises that have been, that have occurred, if you like, and that there's a problem with one of the richest economies in the world telling people that they got to wait till 2020, 2021, 2023, depending on what the actual issue happens to be. I think that different things could have been done, better choices could have been made. Tax changes could have been fairer, for example. I've spelled that out already. Um, there, there is something wrong in a situation where a single person earning 25,000 uh, gets 65 euro a year better off, but somebody with three, time, uh, three times the income uh, has five times the gain. A, a single person with 75 gets five times uh, the gain of a person that the person earned 25,000. There's something wrong with that, particularly when fairer options were there, where everybody could have got 100, and that would mean that would mean the millionaire got 100, but it would mean that the people on low income got, it, got 100 as well. Um, now, there's a low total tax take is not sustainable. This, for us, is a critical issue. And the kind of nonsense that goes on all of the time dodges the issue. Ireland is a low tax country. We can argue about our income tax and all these kinds of things, but at the end of the day, when you look at the total tax that we take, when you put everything together, 
put it all there, put it all in there. Um, uh, we have, we take only two thirds the European, the European average. And I think we need to be looking much more to, uh, to uh, moving towards the European average. Otherwise, we will not be able to provide the infrastructure and the social services that are required to deal with the crises that are out there. We're going to be stuck with child poverty, we're going to be stuck with homelessness rising in both cases, we're going to be stuck with an urban-rural divide, we're going to be stuck with the, the range of issues that anybody uh, listening or watching this or are here today can actually d uh, list out very easily. Greater public investment is required. Uh, we need to get away, government needs to get away from this idea that in some way or other the private sector is going to do this whole job uh, of investment. It never has and it never will. The private sector absolutely has a very important role to play, but the private sector alone will not provide the infrastructure required. And I think the approach taken in 2018 towards addressing the need for a substantial program of building social housing illustrates the problem. It is totally inadequate. The idea that in some way or other, depending on, by the way, depending on where you read it, uh, whether they're going to have 3,800 social houses, 4,000 social houses, 1,000 houses, or whatever they're going to have um, by, by, uh, in, in 2018. The waiting lists are over 90,000 households. At that rate of going, it'll take 25 years to clear the waiting list that's there at the moment, but you're not dealing with all the waiting lists that's emerging. Not alone that, but the, 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 the focus on that government has, for example, on saying, oh, well, we're, we're increasing the, uh, house, uh, the, the, the HAP payment for people uh, who are struggling to, to meet their rents. The problem with that is that it doesn't actually provide a single additional house. But what it does do is it puts more and more people in the rental market, driving the price up because the demand grows and the supply isn't there. We've argued over and over again that we need substantial increase in social housing provision. We've shown how that can be done, how it can be financed off the books. In fact, we've also shown how it could be financed on the books, but that would involve action at a European level. And either way, as Michelle pointed out already, 750 million being made available from the investment fund for developers and so on. I think what we're looking at is that could have easily been used as the basic seed money for an off the, the books uh, in, in investment. So um, that, and an off the books investment that would have started very substantial growth in uh, the provision of social housing. Uh, we're going to see homelessness continue to rise until there is a fundamental change in government policy on housing. Budget proofing is one issue that uh, there was some, uh, he, the, we welcome what the minister had to say and he's, he's taken his time, but it's going in the right direction. It's part of the agreement between Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael in the government, and we're, we welcome that. And he, what he said was that the government is working with partners such as the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission to achieve the goal set out in the program for government relating to equality and gender proofing uh, of budget measures. We think that that should be part of the story all the time. Um, I think, in conclusion, budget is choice. In the budget, government makes choices. It makes choices about the future of society. It me makes choices about the direction we're going to go. It makes choices about the issues that are to be addressed. We believe that there's no great coherence in this budget. It sort of is a budget of low tax, low investment, low ambition. It lacks the kind of uh, vision that's required to see a future that's vibrant, that has good economy, that has good services and infrastructure, uh, and just taxation toward, that is sustainable, that deals with issues like climate that we have to deal with. We need all of those issues to move, to be looked at simultaneously within a budget framework. We ourselves have provided an option for such a framework. It's in a uh, there's a reference to it there on page 24 of the, the last page of our budget uh, analysis, and you can look it up on our website, and we have set out a framework that we think is a coherent uh, uh, approach to building that type of society, a society that was fair, a society where 
everybody had sufficient and where we had a vibrant economy, just taxation, where we had good governance and sustainable policies across the board. I, I'm afraid budget 2018 doesn't uh, sort of reach the kind of levels that it ought to have reached, particularly given our point in our kind of development and there is the point of, and the fact that Ireland is today uh, one of the richest countries in the world. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, now I'm just going to open the question and answer session. Before we start, anybody uh, who is viewing online, any questions, if you have, email them to conference at socialjustice.ie. Sarah will pick them up and relay them to us here at the top table and we'll answer them. There is a roving mic uh, if you raise your hand and then identify yourself before you ask your question. Thank you. So, Kitty, um, the roving mic is just I just wondered what did you think I, of the um, two euro increase in the child benefits allowance? Yeah. Can you identify yourself? I'm sorry, the, from the, from the Irish Times. Your viewers, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Just from the Irish Times. I just wanted to get your view on the two euro increase in the qualified child allowance. And I think yeah. James had a question as well. He's just yeah. Uh, Paul Sweeney from Task. Uh, a tremendous piece of evidence-based work. And my first first question is, did you get any sleep last night? <laughs> it's, that was it's very impressive indeed and well done. Um, I, my question is on uh, Sean's very strong point, and I totally agree with him, is that Ireland is a low-tax economy, but it's about presenting that argument. Uh, when you say that, you scare the life out of uh, dare I say, Middle Ireland or low-paid Ireland or anyone, because Irish people simply do not understand <coughs> taxation. I mean, we tax them more on consumption than on incomes, and they only talk about income tax. There's uh, so-called independent e uh, commentators on the budget, and I'm afraid, Kitty, that the Irish Times is tied up with one of the PwC, is it, who just got done in South Africa for for tax cheating and, um, you know, who are who invented the double Dutch Irish sandwich. Uh, or tea have tied up with KPMG and the independent commentators are far from independent. And this is what people like us stand against. And it's quite a challenge. And how do we address that challenge when everything is stacked against those of us who are interested in addressing the greatest economic in issue in our time, which is inequality? Thanks, Paul. Uh, I'll just respond to Kitty. Thanks, Kitty, for the question. I suppose it begins to restore that payment to what it was previously, which was the combined value of the qualified child and child benefit was supposed to be one third of the adult personal rate. But in terms of addressing things such as child poverty, reaching our child poverty target or supporting low income families, whether they're in employment or not, <coughs> it doesn't really go very far. So. In actual fact, it'll probably be minuscule for those families, and that's what's disappointing. At least the department has acknowledged it, but uh, the increase could have been a lot more. And when you look at, yes, there was some investment in TUSLA and ECCE, but the affordable childcare scheme itself just seems to have stalled. It was supposed to be rolled out this September. It's now October. Where is it going? You know, what are the blockages in that system? How are we providing services for children, and what's our plan for that? And we don't seem to have a plan. And I think Sean, you'll respond to Paul. Uh, Paul Sweeney's question about the low tax economy and uh, how to deal with this issue. We have a serious problem in Ireland. Um, I remember when we started out uh, thirty years, more than thirty years ago, uh, analysing and critiquing budgets like this. Uh, one of the things that was in the background was a study that had just been published earlier in the 1980s. Uh, and that was the, Euro uh, the European Values and Attitudes study, which looked has become a huge uh, study nowadays, uh, looking at all the European countries and long, far beyond Europe. But in those days, there was maybe a dozen countries uh, that were part of it. And Ireland had its own report. And one of the things that I remember clearly was that the uh, researchers concluded that cheating the revenue was the Irish disease. That Irish people thought it was a terrific achievement if they could not pay their taxes. 
<laughs> now, whether there's historical reasons for this or whatever, I don't know. But I think we have kind of maybe uh, not maybe it doesn't <coughs> be so much uh, so popular to talk about cheating the revenue anymore. But what is there all the time is a constant feeling that we are uh, overtaxed. And like in reality, what we need to do is recognize that if we want European levels of service, like say continental Europe has great infrastructure, great service, and say the European 15 countries. Uh, and we would, I think most Irish people would aspire to having services and infrastructure at that level. You can't do that with American levels of taxation. That's a square, you can't sort of square that circle. You either have one or the other. And I don't believe that Irish people are closer to Boston than Berlin. I believe very strongly that Irish people, when you look at even the poll in the Irish Times, talking about the Irish Times a minute ago, the poll last week showed that twice as many people were interested in infrastructure uh, expenditure and expenditure on services than were looking at tax cuts in, as the priority in the budget. And I, I, I think that's a poll that people stand up and say, like, this is a valid analysis. This isn't. This isn't some advocate like us or an analyst like, like us making this point. This is an objective poll. So it seems to me that we have a very serious journey to travel, which requires leadership at a political level that sets out the connections between tax and the rest of it. And I think the way to do that might be to think in terms of, first of all, pointing out and getting people to realize that a lot of the problems that we have are not going to be solved in a year or two or in one term of office of a government. That they're going to take up to 10 years and even in some cases more, but certainly think in terms of two full terms of office, two, 10 years, because otherwise we won't be able to deal with the housing issue, the child poverty issue, the urban rural issue, and a whole lot of other stuff, okay? So what I think we need is some kind of a recognition that we need to take that long term that means that we need to get all uh, some agreement on what needs to be done to get us to the destination that we agree should be our destination and how that should be sequenced because we can't do it all in year one or year two. But I think Irish people generally would buy the argument if there were those conditions, if they were fully involved in shaping the decisions. The problem I have at the moment with government uh, is that there is very little real dialogue be going on between the government and the various sectors of society, at least some sectors of society that would represent a lot of people who are uh, suffering or who are excluded in one form or another. There's a certain amount of engagement, but I have a concern that there's no kind of systematic engagement looking at the direction and looking at where what needs to be done, what could be, like, what would Ireland look like if we had dealt with homelessness, we had enough social housing, there was no child poverty, um, nobody was, uh, there was no working poor, you know, that uh, we had proper broadband in rural Ireland, uh, you know, uh, and, and you could make a list and get an awful lot of people who would agree with it. How do we get from here to there? I think that we need political discussion about that, we need political leadership on that, but we also need acceptance by the political system that you can't govern and do this kind of work without engaging the various sectors of society. And that's what we need, I think, going forward. Uh, and we have the capacity, I think, to do it. We have the resources to do it. Do we have the ambition? Do we have the kind of vision of where we might go? And are we prepared to actually do the work that's involved and take the risks involved? Because not everything works out. And the problem, I suppose, we have a, a political system that is very tied to sort of the next election or even the next uh, news cycle. So that's an issue that I think that we have to deal with. Thanks, Sean. Uh, any other questions from the floor? W-O-D. Uh, sir, uh, congratulations again, Sean. Willie or DTD? Congratulations again, Sean. Fantastic piece of work, as usual, and very well presented. Just two things. Looking at the total revenue uh, returns there, you're talking about increases in tax, tax levels to pay for services. If you look at income tax and PRSI, uh, they come to about 33 billion, which is slightly over 50%, I think, of total revenue. Uh, on the other hand, corporation tax is only at 
8.5 billion, which is just about 14%, I think, of total revenue. So are you saying basically that the main scope for expansion here for tax increases, because, you know, the income tax, income tax has been increasing, the, the amount contributed to total revenue by income tax has been increasing steadily in recent years. So are you saying that basically the main scope for raising the tax take will be corporation tax going into the future? That's one question. The other question is, when you're comparing the different sectors there of workers from the low paid to the high paid who benefited, benefited from the budget, have you factored in family income supplement into that, or particular, in particular the change announced yesterday? A modest change, yes, but it can make a, a significant difference in some individual cases. Thanks. Any other questions? Oh. Uh, Gavin Riley from TV3. Um, just following off your last answer, Sean, you talked about the need to have a, a master plan and to have everyone signed up to it and potentially to take risks. Um, it sounds a lot like what the Slauncher Care project was meant to be, uh, which concluded a few months ago and which appears to have been completely ignored in Budget 2018. So I suppose the question is, would you have any faith in the makeup of the system as it is that there actually would be the willpower to tackle something like that for other issues, considering when the project is undertaken that no resources are put behind implementing it? Okay. 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 The, the the corporate the usual corporation tax. There is certainly scope in in the system for the corporate tax system to contribute. We would argue some uh, a minimum of another billion, possibly a billion and a half, if uh, we were to have a minimum effective uh, corporate tax rate of six percent. Our calculation, conservative cal calculation, would put the the gain in tax take uh, at over a billion, which is very substantial given that the whole budget is like 65 or 66 billion, whatever it is. Um, the, the second issue is PRSI is low by European standards. Now, the catch is this, that in on the continental Europe, you get far better services and supports for your social insurance contribution so I think this is why you have to have an agreement with people that we're actually going to increase uh, the tax take. But it, the parallel piece of this is that we are going to make sure you have proper health service. It, does, it isn't a, a two-tier system. You're not going to be on the side of the road looking for, for accommodation and so on. So <coughs> I, I think that is that's the, like, there the combination. There's other, there's other pieces of the tax system. Ireland is practically unique in terms of how it's dealing with property tax. And uh, I mean... I think this is an issue we're going to have to deal with at some point. Mm -hmm. We're not dealing with it at the moment. The other piece on the FIS, FIS only applies if you have children. Wherever we have children factored into the equations, because they're not always there, the FIS is included, absolutely. It's, it's part of the model. The other thing in the, do we have confidence in the, the slide to care as the, as the model? Um, slide to care is a very good example of everybody getting around the table at a political level now, involving a certain amount of the players, but not everybody, okay, and coming up with a, a, a certainly a worthwhile, a, 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 propo a plan that is worth considering. It, uh, we would argue it hasn't been given sufficient consideration, and certainly there's nothing in the budget of any substance to move toward, uh, to, to, to deal with, uh, or to, to sort of finance it, or any commitment to implement it. However, I think there's a positive side to the slant care thing. It shows you that all the parties can sit around together, engage with the various uh, uh, stakeholders, and come up with something that they can all sign off on. So it's not impossible for us to think in terms of moving forward. <laughs> the only thing I would say is uh, not everybody is part of the elected system. There are quite strong uh, uh, sectors are there, there are quite strong sectors that get heard independent of that. They're usually at the top end of business or whatever. But there's also substantial parts of the society that, whose voice doesn't get heard within that process either. And I would argue that community and voluntary sector in particular is, is a good example of that. Works and provides services and advocates uh, for people who are experiencing deprivation, poverty, inequality, the whole range of those kinds of issues and uh, I think needs to be maybe heard more in these kinds of arenas uh, and would have to be if we were to get something that would be agreed for a t over a 10-year uh, time frame. Thanks, Sean. 
Sorry. Yeah, I think Sara, apologies. I think we have some webinar questions that I'll just let Sara give to the floor and then we'll go back to the. <laughs> okay, a couple of questions coming in here. Um, one person is concerned about young people in general and is looking at how the budget will overall address the young needs of young people, especially those who are still looking to emigrate for decent work and opportunities. Um, I have another one in here talking about climate change and asking, does the budget do anything substantial to help us meet our climate change targets and to avoid the fines which are likely to be coming down the tracks in coming years. I think maybe we'll hand back to the floor and we'll yeah, take Thanks, forward. Sarah. And just this. Um, Frank Sigil Martin, Leitrim PPN. I just want to first thank Social Justice Ireland for a very good analysis of the budget. But I can't work out, um, there is money gone in to do something with the health crisis. But the difference between a person going into the doctor with a medical card or going in with cash has got worse than it was. Mm -hmm. I met somebody the other day that had after hurt in their shoulder. The doctor could give him gel or could give him tablets, but he needed a cortisone injection, but he had to have 35 euros because it wasn't covered by the medical card. So I feel that the the HSE or whoever deals with it has put the medical card is nearly useless now for anyone that's sick. Thank you. And I don't see it covered in the budget. Thanks very much, Francie. Um, so I'll take the climate change question. Uh, Eamon's going to take the question relating to young people and I'll let I Sean <laughs> deal with health. So, I mean, uh, the, the budget did nothing in terms of climate change and I think it's incredibly disappointing. Um, the fines that we're going to face in just two and a half years time are going to be upwards of 600 million euro. So those are fines we're facing for not meeting the targets we have to meet now. That doesn't, so that's 600 million euro we're going to have to find for those uh, fines. And yet we're putting nothing in place to move to a low carbon future to look at environmental taxation to look at promoting behavioral change. Yes, we have a national <coughs> mitigation plan we have a climate change advisory council so we're very good at putting the structures in place but we're not very good at following through in terms of providing leadership for resources and you know Ireland does like to stand on a world stage and we did take a lead in um, negotiating the sustainable development goals yet we're making no progress in terms of setting targets for those or implementing those either so it's, a, it's incredibly disappointing and I think um, a lot of people today are very unhappy with what was announced in the budget yesterday. Eamon? Um, yeah, in relation to uh, low pay or for, for young people, there was, um, in our budget choices document, we, we advocated the equalisation of job seekers rates and we calculated that it would cost approximately 130 million this year. I mean, that sounds like a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of things, it is, it's, it's, it's quite reasonable. And we said that uh, the, the, the difference in, in the job seekers rates for young people was one of the most unjustified uh, moves that was has taken and, and it's, it's, it's discriminatory that it still remains. We're pleased that at least the five euro increase in the rates has, uh, has gone in full to, uh, to the younger job seekers as opposed to only proportion as last year. But the gap now stands at between uh, 43 euros and 88 euros depending on what age you are. And, um, this, this is something that needs to be looked at. In relation to uh, low paid employment, um, we're, we're, we, we welcomed a few weeks ago the, uh, the fact that there seems to be a move towards the uh, introducing legislation governing uh, the instance of zero hour contracts, but that's not going to solve the issue. The extent to which low paid employment and precarious employment is becoming a, a feature of the labour force has increased greatly over the, the last few years and government needs to do more to, uh, to look at that and there was, there was nothing looking at that at all in, in this budget so we're disappointed with that. Thanks, Amy. Uh, the, the health issue that Francie raised I think opens up major questions because we do have a two-tier healthcare system very clearly um, and we have at the same time quite high levels of expenditure uh, when compared with the OECD countries and so on. 
and it, it sometimes it's not that clear uh, why we're not getting a better service for the kind of level of money that we're actually putting in. Um, one of the problems that we experience in this, uh, trying to analyze what's really going on, is the lack of transparency. And I would, we pointed this out actually in the editorial uh, of, uh, in our response, our analysis of the budget last night, this morning, <coughs> that we published today. And we're basically saying that the analysis, when we analyze the budget documents supplied by government, there is some questions about transparency. Um, for, like, we do not believe, for example, that the information and the backup figures on the healthcare budget are really transparent. The minister said he was putting 600 million more into health care. We can identify some of that. But there's an awful lot of smoke and mirrors involved in this process. And we don't think that's good enough. For ex I, we believe, for example, that TDs and senators should all have crystal clarity in terms of the budget, the various allocations, what they're supposed to get out of these allocations, and so on. It's not at all clear, for example, that there's a, there is currently a deficit of 100 million, roughly, um, uh, that the but that the HSE is running over at the moment. It's not clear at all from the budget numbers whether that's going to be paid for in 2017, whether it's being carried forward into 2018, whether there's a provision to cover that level of service in 2018. It seems to me that one of the things you should do that government should do, and that we should insist as an electorate and, and voters and citizens, we should insist that government is clear about what it sets out, and that we should know from looking at the budget documentation uh, what exactly is planned with the money. We should also know where exactly it's going and what exactly it's producing. And I think the, our comment on the healthcare uh, part of the budget that's not the only place where there isn't clarity. There isn't clarity, as I pointed out earlier on, on some of the housing projections either, and what exactly is planned. Even though there's a plan and there's endless talk and endless press releases and so on, and very uh, lo lo lots of words, uh, the cl there isn't clarity about exactly how, for example, government proposes to deal with more than 90,000 households on waiting lists. So while we welcome new initiatives and increased overall expenditure on health that have been announced, uh, it's not possible to maintain the existing, we believe it's not possible to maintain the existing level of service on the money that's actually being made available. So it, like you, the, the point being that if you're going to announce a whole series of new things and you're not actually going to maintain the, provide enough money for the existing level of service, then government should actually be honest and say, these are the services that we're going to cut in 2018 uh, while we in initiate other things. Thanks very much, Sean. I, unless there are any other questions from the floor. Oh, Sarah so has something coming in from. Yeah. We have a question here about overseas development aid that came in. Yeah. Um, it said, many years ago, we made a commitment to move towards 0.7% of GDP as overseas development aid. Would the panel like to comment on how this target has moved and what efforts are being made to meet it? Because it still seems grossly inadequate, given the levels of poverty and disadvantage across the world. Sure. Um, the target, as you mentioned, is a UN agreed one of 0.7% of national income. So. These days, I think uh, GNI Star is the is probably the best, most realistic um, uh, benchmark for that. We reached 0.59 percent in 2008, and since then, not surprisingly, given what happened economically, uh, there was a steady fall from then until uh, the last couple of years. It stabilised in 2015 or so, and what we've seen over the last couple of years is very small incremental increases. Uh, nothing that indicates any kind of uh, logical framework for which we could even reach again the 0.59%, never mind the 0.7%. The increase that we saw this year was welcome. Uh, 55 million is, is an okay amount of money, but it, it really only moves us a tiny bit in the, in the right direction. And uh, that, that, that was disappointing to see. And there's still, there's still no framework for, 
for when are we when are we going to hit that target? We're lagging well behind um, our counterparts in Europe, uh, Luxembourg, Denmark, the UK. They're all hitting that 0.7 percent and have been for a while. So it's disappointing that uh, Ireland Ireland is is nowhere near it right now. Thanks, Simon. And we have two more questions: one from Seamus and then one from Jennifer as well. Firstly, congratulations to Social Justice Ireland, as usual. Comprehensive analysis of, of the budget, which serves civil society and communities enormously, so really well done. I just probably make a comment that you're well used to hearing. Uh, that we're doing an analysis, but one of the things we discovered yesterday, in terms of priorities, uh, if you look at the media and if you look at TV and radio, you would imagine <laughs> rural development is pretty well up there in terms of priorities. But when you look at the allocation of funding via department, uh, the, I'm afraid Rural and Gale is literally at the bottom. Um, and we're quite concerned that given it's so far behind in so many measurements, including ones you've published, uh, have your views on when this is going to change? Because we're not, we're certainly underwhelmed with this budget. Thanks, Seamus. And just Jennifer. Jennifer. Sorry, Jennifer. Sorry, Jennifer. Sorry, Jennifer. Jennifer Thompson, St. Vincent de Paul. Um, reiterate a huge congratulations on this very useful and informative document. Um, just a quick question in relation to education and to get your perspective. Um, we all know the research behind education being the best route out of um, disadvantage uh, and a best start in, in life and for the future. But there was very little in the budget in terms of addressing cost of um, primary and secondary education and indeed tertiary as well in terms of addressing um, you know, the book rental scheme, the so-called voluntary contribution, um, the adjacent grant and SUSE. Uh, so just to get your, your comment on that. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I'll take both of those. So yes, Seamus, absolutely. It's one of the points I made earlier that um, there's a lot of lip, lip services paid to what's happening in the regions at the moment, uh, maybe because it's politically expedient, but when it comes to resourcing, it's not there. <coughs> like the resourcing that is required for their action plan for rural development. I don't see it anywhere across any department. It's incredibly disappointing. Uh, it's still unclear in terms of even the rural transport program, what allocation that has received for 2018. And, you know, this requires leadership and it requires making a choice because if you, you know, the government has two choices. It can actually do something about um, you know promoting enterprise in the regions, making them more accessible, making sure people have access to services, simple things like broadband. To do that requires funding. Uh, the only thing that this government seemed to want to fund in this budget to raise extra revenue for was to deliver on small reductions in the USC and uh, changes to the tax bond. They didn't go and raise revenue to fund anything else. And I think that's incredibly disappointing. Um, to be honest, I do think they're going to hear us on the doorsteps and on local radio, you know, and when they <coughs> get back, a lot of them get back to their constituencies, particularly the government TVs and backbenchers, you know, uh, constituents are not going to be happy because despite, you know, we've had months and months and months of talk. We've had years, and I know Seamus, you've had too many years of listening to the proposed rollout of broadband and yet we the tender hasn't even been sorted out yet it's saying 2018 are we going to be waiting till 2030 you know i honestly think we probably will be um and jennifer yeah i mean actually you know we had very similar proposals to the vincent ball in terms of education you know grants for part-time students you've done a lot of work on the cost of education at all levels um, there was nothing in the budget to address that whatsoever, which is really disappointing. And even in terms of just capitation grants for schools, you know, weren't increased <coughs> just to reverse the cuts of previous years, not even looking to the, you know, the demographic allowance is really to employ enough teachers so that we have enough teachers to teach our children. But despite the huge amount of work SVP have put in in this area and it wouldn't cost a huge amount of money, yet a choice was made not <coughs> to address it, which is really disappointing. And Sean just, just wants to say a few words before we wrap. We're coming to a wrap, for particularly at least for the people who are following us on, 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 online and uh, on the broadcast. 
uh, in the final minute. Uh, just to, we want to say thanks to everybody, obviously, that came and uh, that everybody that's been watching. Uh, we've been tracking it here on the, on the screen ourselves as well, and there's quite an amount of interest. Uh, thanks to the questions that have come and so on. Uh, we'll still be here to deal with questions for people here um, uh, after, after we close. But we want to draw your attention to, to the fact that uh, we will, our, our annual conference is on the 21st of November, and its general title is Society Matters. And we will be looking particularly at issues around participation and how to improve participation in a situation and engagement uh, in, in a society where there is, a, a, we would argue, a, a growing unhealthy uh, division growing uh, between different parts of society and particularly, uh, we'd say, between the political system and others in, 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 the, in the society. Uh, so there'll be information on that very soon, within a day or two, on our website and people can register for it and as, as always. It will be held in Croke Park and it will be all a day on, the, on the November 21st. You're all welcome to that. i hand back to Michelle to wrap up. Um, thanks, Sean. So I just want to thank you all for coming and just thank everybody for viewing online. Uh, the document is to be live on our website now as well. Just you should all have hard copies and if anyone has any queries or questions you know don't hesitate to contact us and don't hesitate to use what's in the document as well um, in your own day-to-day -day work so thank you very much thank you <laughs> we're available to, to to answer anything else and give a lot of questions that people might still have that have to be with us Oh, Jerry. Jerry, yes. sorry to wait till the very end, John. You know, no, you're done, you're done, you're done. Done. I just thought, uh, over the years, when I hear the budget, the, always the point you made about the 25, the person on 25,000 or 75,000, the uh, inequality of the person on the higher income getting a lot more. And I suppose the answer always given was, well, how can you, if somebody is making more, they're bound to, if they're still